Good? All right. I'm going to start now because if I wait too long, I'm worried the voice is going to go. And I just want to get through this presentation so you guys can ask your questions, please. Um, so if you're here, you're here to listen to me talk about making <coughs> Mass.gov's releases boring. And if you're not here for that, you probably want to get out of here. So <clears throat> my name is Melissa Rossi. Um, I currently work at Digital Services. I've been there for six years. I've been working with Drupal for the last two years, and <clears throat> I've been doing multiple different roles as developer. I'm working with QA testing, as well as release automation. That's why this whole presentation came about. <clears throat> um, those are my GitHub and LinkedIn. If you want to fo follow me or see what I've been working on, Please look at those. Um, so facts about Mass.gov. I'm pretty sure every one of you have visited Mass.gov, hopefully, right? License, anything like that. Okay. Taxes. Taxes, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so when you visit Mass.gov, is there a certain period of time when you're visiting it? Like, is it during the morning, at night, any other, you know, different times, right? Mass.gov is up 24-7. We have about, we're, we use Drupal 8, and we have about 600 authors that are using, that are, have created content on Mass.gov. We have over 50,000 pages that are, that are published, and 150,000 documents, which, which is to say we're kind of crying about that right now, but... Um, we have over, we've created over 26 content types, and when I say content types, that's different types of pages. So like, you know, news articles, um, location pages, uh, topic pages. These are some of the, like, what we consider content types. For, um, with Mass.gov, we have a theming layer or a design system that we use, and it's called Mayflower. It's a public repo, so if you do want to check out the, the um, Mayflower, please go to that um, GitHub. About 12 to 16 million page views per month is on uh, mass.gov. So it's not a small site, everyone. It's, it's pretty big. Um, I know I use it personally for my license and everything. I use it for my taxes. I use it for multiple other things. but. It is a resource that any one of you can use it. We release twice a week, and that is on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, we release at night, and those are usually during the 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. times. So when we release, you guys will never see anything happen to the website. At least we cross our fingers every time we do that. But our content authors are pretty much can't touch our site when we're releasing. It's their config imports, there's database updates and everything, so we tell them to stay out. We update our Mayflower weekly. So every Wednesday, <coughs> every Wednesday we update the um, Mayflower theme. This is incorporated into our Thursday night releases. Um, we, as, re as release managers, we start this process at noontime on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So our average releases contain about eight pull requests, which could be small, could be large, could be median. I mean, it could be anything. And from the diagram, you could see like, that's our PCs, we use Macs, but I didn't have a Mac icon. But GitHub, we, we deploy the stage, and the person there is the person that's QA testing, and then we package it for the, the nightly deployment so that we can deploy it at night. So that person on the previous screen is the release manager. 
And as you can see, I'm very unhappy every time I release, which will be next Thursday. Well, no, release previously I was unhappy. Now, I'm happy. <laughs> so, as a release manager, we handle multiple different hats, as we call them. And we basically um, do integration testing, we did general smoke testing, human eye for the Mayflower stuff, and we visit pages to make sure that they were appearing. No 500 errors. Cross your fingers, people. Cross your fingers. And then we would pre prepare the release process. We, during this time, like from 12 to 5, I would say, we would manage any issues. And when I say issues, you would hope you would not get an issue. There's no guarantee, though. I think I ran around like my, a chicken with a head cut off a few times going, what is going on? Um, but we would try to remedy it as fast as possible and get it deployed that night. When we deployed, we have to make sure that the release process is as stable as possible to go out to production because there's no like ifs, ands, and buts about it. <laughs> so how do we do reduce this burden on the release managers? And this is where we said, okay, our releases are going out. They're going out okay. But then the next day you would hear something from somebody going, uh, why is my content not showing? Or why is my page not available? Or why is the icon over there and it's supposed to be over there? Uh, I, I couldn't tell you. So we started using testing tools. The testing tools was something that we added into our release process. BHAT was our first testing tool. And BHAT is um, a testing tool for behavioral testing. And basically, um, we used it in Gherkin. Gherkin is supposed to be a very um, text plain language, so it's very non programmy So developers, like me, don't like to use it. <laughs> I like to hand it off to somebody else if I could. But um, basically, it has features, scenarios, and given, and, and then. Very simple. Some of these, we had about 65 features now in mass.gov. And we could have about five to six to nine scenarios depending on what it is and everything. So basically, this was our first testing tool we had in the release process. How did this reduce our burden? It covered multiple aspects. It, it covered our content types. It covered our roles and permissions. We didn't want one like editor permission, I mean editor role and author role to, we, author roles are not supposed to be able to publish, but if somehow it got snuck in, you know, they could be publishing and we just don't want them to. We added some security behind it. We added some custom module and some site-wide, <coughs> excuse me, site-wide elements to cover us. BHAT covered us to a point and we would update it and we would add new tests and everything, but it wasn't, it wasn't good enough for us. And because, it's, because of that, we needed to add something else. And that something else was PHP units in Drupal test traits. Now, PHP units in Drupal test, tra tra uh, test traits, I'm just gonna call it DTT from now on. <laughs> um, PHP unit is a framework, and it was included in Drupal 8. Well, we have Drupal 8, so let's use it. And we started using it. But the problem with the PHP units is some of the classes that are shipped with core, Drupal core, can wipe your database. <laughs> Would you like to raise your hand if it happened to you? <laughs> OK, all right, I'm glad. Um, so, we don't want that. But we did have somebody that was in-house, uh, Mosh, who created a great tool which called, was called Drupal Test Traits. 
And we use those features from core, but we don't wipe our database, which is a good thing. Um, I would recommend checking out this blog. It is a great blog about the Drupal test traits, and it goes over in details on, on some of the features of Drupal test traits. Um, Drupal test traits does have some great features built into it. How did this reduce our burden? So PHP unit and Drupal test trait, um, we were able to create different tests that we couldn't create with BHAT. And an example would be our site-wide alerts. They use JavaScript. And BHAT, for us, we didn't have JavaScript included in our BHAT testing. So we were able to test our site-wide alerts with PHP units. Um, a great story behind PHP units and uh, Drupal test traits was that we were able to, I don't know if you all, two weeks ago, the core update, security update that was like major, if you had Drupal 8, you better be on call. Yeah, yeah, okay. So <laughs> PHP units saved us. And that's because we had to update our meta tags module. We have some custom modules and one of them happened to be the meta tag. The PHP unit caught it, saying that your meta tags aren't showing on this page anymore. You need to fix this before you deploy it to production. And basically, this was like the second round. The first one was when it said you don't have it, and then somehow we edited it, made it some changes, and then we added too many. So, you know, it was just like, Okay, thanks, thanks PHP units and Drupal test traits. You caught it for us. It wasn't something that we thought of. And we, um, it, we, it was caught by the Drupal test traits. So we had BHAT, we have Drupal test traits, we got the PHP units in there. Those 500 errors, you know, those things, you, you know, you can catch them every once in a while, like on all pages. But how many pages we have, you're yeah, not going to catch them all. So we needed a way of testing more than the five pages that I was doing every time for a release. Nightcrawler. Now, this is a, a tool that was created in February of 2018 for us. It was just to, to test our develop branch every night. It, Nightly, we, we deploy our developer in nightly and we test with the Nightcrawler. Um, so what Nightcrawler does for us is a, it's a Node.js web crawler and it fetches URLs and it aggregates res responses, so like time and everything. And we run it nightly on our CD environment uh, and as well you can run it on your develop environment. And it was created by some people in math.gov team, but also, I don't know if you know this person right in the right here, Rob Bayless. Um, so that's the uh, GitHub repo for the um, Nightcrawler. We use it to test all our content types, which is, we call them sample sizes. So you see on the end there, it says sample equals two. We're telling it to crawl all content types twice, and it will tell us exactly how many 500 errors that you get in those um, items. So this is like 26 items. It takes a little t longer. I was going to do bigger sample size, but it took way too long. But basically, it tells you the 500 errors. It takes the sample size of those two samples on every content type that we have. And it also tells you the URLs that it, it fetched. We can adjust these. We can adjust the target. When I say target, I mean the environment. We can adjust the sample size. So for some releases, we could have done like 100 to 200. Um, it just takes a long period of time on our local because of Wi-Fi and everything. <coughs> So Nightcrawler covered us for the 500 errors. We've got the, we've got the 500 errors covered. Then comes up Mayflower. 
<coughs> Has anybody ever does it de dealt with a design system before? Just integrating it directly into your develop immediately. It's yeah. So you have we cut the tag for Mayflower on Wednesday in the afternoon. We would merge it into our develop with just some functional testing, and then it would go in and into our develop branch. And then that night, Nightcrawler would say, oh, sample size, it would crawl it. Well, the design system is not just going to show you, <coughs> it's not going to give you 500 errors. It's also going to be the design itself. It changes the design. So we added backstop. Backstop was our visual, reg re visual re regression testing. And it was just to check for designs and theme changes. Um, so for releases, we would run production as a reference and stage as our testing and s compare the two. And y you're able to um, use any environment with this backstop that we create and that we um, implemented. Um, but when it was first originally brought in, we only could do nine scenarios because we are mass.gov. We're a dynamic site, so it's changing every day. So it's not good to use the actual site. We, we created what we call quality assurance golden QAG pages. And those were our baseline tests where developers, as well as during the release process, we could compare. And we created about 54 of them. 54 different paid content types on production where we can run a test on backstop and compare it to our stage environment. Run it against production and then run it against our develop. <coughs> um, we had great team members that created those 54 pages because I started out creating them. And that ended in two weeks with only three pages. And it's, there are just so many different things you could do with these pages that we needed to have more people. So we brought in 20-plus team members to create these 54 um, QAG pages. And that happened in less than an hour. So I st stood there just watching, going, this is how we should have done it. <laughs> nice. So we reduced the burden with backstop for our Mayflower integration. We're able to also test our production site. So when we have our production site with one tag and we deploy, we're able to test that new tag as well against the old tag, because we always have that. So it makes it so much easier to say, OK, we've got this from, previous, from the previous tag, this from the new tag, and this is what's supposed to change. And you know, nothing else should have. It's good. So the revolution of the testing tools, <clears throat> BHAT was there from the beginning. We had lots of manual testing. That was me, that, that human stick figure. And then July 2018 is when we started adding all of these testing tools into our release process. BHAT and PHP unit and Drupal test traits came in immediately into our automation. So every pull request that we get in mass.gov is automatically tested against these, these two items. Um, Nightcrawler and Backstop were only tested on release branches, and it was much smaller. We were using like 100, 150 sample size, which is, and then Backstop was 36, and then 54. We gave the choice to the four release managers that we had on, st on staff. And then there was some manual testing still. Come November 15th, everything changed. <laughs> we started adding BHAT, PHP, which was already there, but then we added Nightcrawler and Backstop to the automation for the release. And as you can see, those change the changes were substantial that Nightcrawler went from 100 to 150 all the way up to 700. Backstop was always testing 54 and limited manual testing. So this was a huge improvement on our like testing. Like we were testing everything we could think of. 
But wait, the release manager still had to do a lot of the stuff before the automation was added. So between that July 2018 and November, that was all release managers. So you could be spending about two hours to three hours on a release process. So this was what we had for the release process and this was all done by the release manager. We, we were cutting the release branch, we're updating the change log, we're pushing the GitHub, we're manually deploying we're waiting for the deployment, because every time we deploy to stage, we would need a fresh da database because we want to use the most up-to-date from production. We would be manually running our Nightcrawler, manually running our backstop. Let me just tell you, my computer's fan made a loud noise every time I run that Nightcrawler and every time I ran backstop. It only crashed a few times, but, you know. And then once everything was clear and, you know, testing was good, you know, we would merge that release branch in to master and then clone, clone our Acquia repo. And I don't know if anybody's used Acquia before, but you need to have not just a GitHub repo, but you also have to have a mirror image in Acquia to tag to deploy. Yeah. So we would have to clone our Acquia repo and then tag the master branch. Once we added automation, which is that fully automated, the 700, night, 700 um, sample size for Nightcrawler and uh, 54 scenarios for backstop, basically the release manager all had, only had to do was cut that release branch and push it to GitHub. <laughs> Let me tell you. I was so excited, I was running around the building, high-fiving people. <laughs> yeah, people can say, oh, I was high-fiving people. Um, we configured the CI tool to deploy. So as soon as the, our CI tool would get the um, branch and push it to Acquia, it would start running our BHAT and our, and our PHP units and the Drupal test traits. Then it would ask us, do we want to deploy to stage? And we'd just say, yes, please, deploy. And it would deploy the release branch to stage. And then with a new database, which was great, and I didn't have to type anything. And then it would run the Nightcrawler and then run the backstop in parallel. So it was doing these set tasks all by itself. And we also, during this automation, thought, it, thought we would add that little positive where I don't have to clone the Acquia repo anymore. I can tag right through GitHub. So when we cut a new tag in GitHub, we have our CI tool which will clone our Acquia repo and tag it with that same, um, same tag in Acquia. And I'm just going to show you a five-minute video of the automation, of automating the release process. And this is what it does. This is what I would just discuss. So as soon as you hit the hold, it's saying, okay, I'm going to deploy. And as soon as it's, de it's deploying to the stage environment, <coughs> it's running through our deploy code doing our database update, config import, anything like that, it's green, it's good. So then it goes into the Nightcrawler, 500 errors. And basically, it's set up to run sample size on our release branch for 700. Looks all green here, which is great. Um, and then same as before, you saw that in the, <coughs> the image before. And then as soon as the Nightcrawler is done, backstop, backstop is running also. That's why I missed some of the Backstop because it was running at the same time. But it's already ran a reference point against production. Right here is showing how it's running against our stage environment. Backstop <coughs> um, takes about 10 minutes. Nightcrawler takes about three minutes to run. That's like 13 minutes total. If I was doing it locally, Nightcrawler would take about 30 minutes with 100 to 150 sample size. 
and backstop might take me 20 minutes. So you see the, the change in time and the period of time of working on the release process. This is all done with our CI tool. And, and basically, um, it's a little slower, but it's just showing how it's running on our stage with different scenarios. So it's, it's running all 54 scenarios. Um, so then once it's ran those scenarios, it's going to compare. So it's going to take whatever we have on production as a reference point and compare it to our stage environment. And as you can see, it's already pulling up some differences here and there. Uh, we have a threshold of 0.05, which is pretty low. You don't want to go too low because it will pin pinpoint everything. But we want it low enough that we see any slight changes to the actual screenshot. I will say that it does pick up fonts, though. <laughs> And the fonts could be because it just didn't load the page fast enough. Um, the great thing about ha having this automation is we can switch it over to any other release manager. So let's say I don't feel good, which I don't feel good. <laughs> and I decide, all right, I got the branch, but I really just don't feel good, guys. I'm, I'm going to tap out here. You know, I can send it to anybody else, and anybody else can know what's going on and how to how to react to anything, any any changes and everything. <laughs> um, this is taking a lot longer than expected. It seemed faster when I was doing this. Um, so it would compare, and there we go. And then it uploads everything. So we have an area where it uploads all of our images. So if anybody other than myself wants to look at them, like a project manager, another developer, um, another release manager, it's all in one place. They have access to it. We have some people, project managers, that like, so did Backstop run correctly? Uh, yeah, I could show it on my laptop. Well, wait a minute. It's in our CI tool now, so you can just, here's, your, here's the URL. It's so much easier compared to what we were doing beforehand. I would have to zip it up in a nice little package for them and say, here. Um, so the backstop results. I don't know if you've used backstop before. This was actually with the core update. We actually saw this happen. And anytime we run automate, uh, any deployment, we actually run backstop automatically as well as the nightcrawler. So basically, it said, you know, 58 passed, 50 failed. It's a core update. It shouldn't have changed anything, right? Uh, yeah, it did. So that's production. Do you notice that something in the menu that shouldn't have been there? The home link that came in from our core update, so it wasn't something we would look for, but we found it. So it's just a benefit of having the backstop in there. Uh, yeah, I don't want that. So what's the benefits of adding all this automation and everything and adding all these testing tools? We reduce the risk level. We, by when I say we, we reduce the risk level, we run these testing tools on every, any change to the release. So if we make changes like we're saying, oh, this is not working correctly, let's make this change, these testing tools are automatically ran again. So we're covering our bases. We increase the confidence of the whole team. And when I say we increase the confidence, we weren't what we call hot fix Friday was a known thing in our department. It's a very well-known thing that nobody should talk about ever again. Um, we increased the velocity of deploying new code. And it's just so much simpler. Like When we had that core update, we knew, OK, we got the stuff in here. So let's look at other things. This stuff is going to be covered. Let's look at the um, small things that might not be covered. And it's just 
we have more confidence and more, I don't know how to say it, but like, I'll take a release on any day now. Um, we enforce consistent, consistent process. And when I say that, the release managers were able to say, oh, I'll do 150, another release manager could do 100 on, on Nightcrawler. It's always 700 now. There's no different, no changes to it. We dramatically reduce the time of the release manager. Like I said, it took us two hours. It takes us 30 minutes now. So I get to twiddle my thumbs for a bit every once in a while. Um, 30 minutes to cut the release branch and basically look at the results of Backstop, BHAT, Drupal test traits, and the Nightcrawler. Um, the, t the automated testing and deployment to do more of the work in less time, like I said, it would take us about two hours. For our CI tool to, to do this whole thing, for a release process, it only takes about less than 50 minutes for it to run through everything. And it makes it so much easier to hand off if need be, if anything, emergency, not feeling good, or anything like that. These were our benefits. Um, that's it. Um, any questions? Sure. What was the decision process in selecting these tools? Because we all know there's like a shit ton out there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, BHAT was already there, so we, we said, okay. The Drupal 8, the Drupal 8 included the PHP unit and the, um, well, we added the Drupal test traits, but that was already included in Drupal 8, so we wanted to re re kind of use that. It's already in place. The Nightcrawler was created because of the 500 error, so we needed a tool to cover us for 500, so we created that tool, and we worked with a team. Backstop. Backstop was actually used in Mayflower, and we said, because our developers sometimes go from Mayflower to, oops, sorry, Mayflower to our, our mass repo, we didn't want them going to two different tools, so we kept the same tool in place so that people would know how to use Backstop, how to use, um, how to use the Backstop, because I know, for me, I go into Mayflower, and if I have another tool I have to figure out how to use, it's going to take me much longer to get, get a pull request. And it was already in place in Backstop, so we pulled it over to, to our mass repo. Um, the only reason it took so long for us to get the Backstop in was because mass.gov changes. Uh, Mayflower is a static site. We, we needed to create a lot of QAG pages to get that in, in place. And that's where you hired that team? Uh, yes. So... Um, yeah, basically the the backstop we, we we basically just pulled in ourselves. Okay. The nightcrawler was a team effort with um, Rob and a few others that created the nightcrawler for us. Any other questions? I know you mentioned um, how happy you are and probably the other release managers are, but how much of a culture shock, culture change? How much of the work that you did was just? changing the culture of the people that were there to accept this type of thing? It was kind of, um, it, was, it was definitely a change, like to think and to actually big, bring it up to our, my boss mm -hmm. at some point, like saying, yeah, we kind of need these tools, we kind of need to, you know, implement some of these changes and everything. And I think it was also chatter around the developers and everything. I would be slacking with Rob every once in a while Yusuf and a few others and just saying it'd be nice if we had something in here and and basically it, It's also we had other teams working with us on the backstop piece So they kind of saw the changes and kind of oh, okay. This is what it's doing. Oh, okay This is how how it works. This is what it's gonna do and, and we also after bringing these testing tools in, we also brought it to the broader range, like the content team, the data team, and they, we showed them what we did and everything, just so they have an idea of what we're trying to do, bring into the system and, and the release process. And, and if 
there's some other teams that like search would be working on something. If you guys could write some testing tools behind these, like you're testing for meta tags or schema or something like that. It, it became a cultural change, but you know, it was welcomed okay. in a good way. That's what I was looking for, because yeah. lots of times you find that resistance. Yeah, it, it was definitely welcomed in a good way because of some of the things that were going on. Okay. Anybody? I just didn't catch um, the your QA gold, your baseline pages. Were those? Did you put those in production? Yeah, and then yeah. they got copied into your yeah. testing site. Yeah. Like so that. we we put the QAG pages directly in production, and the reason being, <coughs> um, we referenced it in production because we wanted to. The, our production site is the only place where our database stays, so we need to have it in the database. And if we put it in anywhere else, it would just go bye bye. Yeah. So, so um, uh, follow up on that. How, yeah. Are they hidden from uh, end users? They are somehow. Yeah, they are. They are. We have. They are no index, no follow, and there's also uh, uh, no that suppress the site map search. as well. Yeah, yeah. So they're published, but they're not. You're not going to be able to find them. them. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 How many developers in Mass.gov, how many developers? Uh, there's four, four of us? Five, six, seven. Yeah, there's like, there's four that are usually on site at all times, but we have multiple developers all, all across the board. Um, so I would say in July we had over 18 developers on working on the project. We're now down to maybe 12 or so. So, so you're bringing developers like contract work to do a project and then? Yeah, um, we do, yeah. Okay. Did you say that the, all the tests ran faster in CI than on your local yep. development machine? Why? Because our laptops are, the, the RAM and everything. The, <laughs> also, I should point out that uh, these guys switched over to Docker. Very like they exclusively use Docker for their local development environments, and almost everyone there is on Docker for Mac, which has some pretty known uh, file system performance issues. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it used to shut down every once in a while. We had, we got over that. Are you guys um, saving your snapshots uh, that you do with? Um, Backstop? Yep. Uh, and how does that work? Because I'm, I'm currently futzing with a, uh, a similar tool that's supposed to be much simpler, and it's hell. Uh, so I'm kind of curious what, how that works in a more complex system for you guys. Right now, the CI tool we have keeps a, a limited amount of our snapshots. Oh. So, so they just have a so consistent like, disk you can write. Yeah. That. So. We could move it to like a S3 bucket later on if we need to, okay. but we haven't found the need. But, um, but I, I can go back from a month to two months somewhat and look at our backstops that have been ran. So. Oh. Somebody else, I, I've asked a question. So. Uh, I was just wondering if, if, there, uh, if you think about, if you consider going into like test driven development where you write the tests first and then the developers write the actual code to make the change. And so there's that feedback. Uh, when we were doing this, we were so fast paced mm -hmm. that the problem was we were developing code faster than we were actually creating the BHAT test and everything. Yeah, so, I mean, that's something that we could definitely look at now because we've slowed down a little bit. But um, we're not really developing new features at this point. We're actually trying to work on stuff that we already have in place to fix it, to to refactor, to make changes, to and just to to fix the performance of some of the pages and <laughs> so if you're doing that, have you considered doing the continuous delivery then? Instead of just we would like to at some point. Um, but the problem is the way we have it set up, like with continuous delivery, we could 
deliver out to production, but because our production site, we have content authors, if we deploy something that might do a database update or a config import, it could knock our authors out. So we can't do it during the day. So we schedule it so it's it's not at a time where our authors could be affected and we try to limit it like if it snows or something like that we have to be like oh site-wide alert maybe we can't deploy during those times so continuous delivery is has been talked about it's just not something that's well, up there that, and that no but but i've argued for it so <laughs> <laughs> so yeah but yeah no <clears throat> Any other questions? You mentioned that um, you get some like font errors that you maybe don't care about because the page you know didn't load fast enough. How are you deciding what errors in design changes you need to pay attention to and which ones you don't? And can you filter those out so you don't end up with like error fatigue? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we know certain pages that where the font doesn't load correctly. And we, we do double check it as a release manager. Um, we double check anything, even if it's a false positive. We could eliminate it, but what if that, if we, if we hide it or something like that and something does change and there, anything like that. I think right at this point with Backstop, we're, we're still seeing the false positives, a lot of like, okay, that is just because the image didn't load fast enough, or that's because the iframe didn't load. We could hide the iframes, but we, it, it's just not something that we have. Backstop is still being worked on. It's still in the process. I mean, it's, it's a great tool, but it has its little catch it, the catches. I just wanted to follow up on that also and say that the Backstop JS part that's part of the final release process is only the very final layer on the visual regression testing. There is a much more like consistent test suite that runs against the design system. And that one, like if there's a uh, regression on that side, they pay serious attention to it. I think that this is just like the final layer of, let's just check these few pages before the site goes out in order to make sure that you know nothing terrible broke like the home home <coughs> link didn't show up in the menu yeah uh, yeah so there's definitely a distinction there and it's very hard to do that kind of visual regression testing against the dynamic site mm -hmm. do you stay do you have to stay in Thursday night to do the publish no <laughs> uh, so next Thursday I will be releasing from home <laughs> at eight o'clock. But you still have to press the button. I still have to press the button. Yeah, I gotta press the button and monitor just to make sure that, that nothing's going on. Like, um, we when we deploy at night, basically what we do is check our backup before our database backup because we automatically back up our database, and then we just deploy the tag out and then we just monitor just to make sure no server issues, no. Do you have rollback? Huh? Robots? No, roll back. Yeah, we do have a process of rolling back. Mass.gov has never rolled back. So, yeah, yeah, Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> they, they, they keep on asking about testing it, and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> do I have to be part of this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> But yeah, there is there is going to be a point where we do have to practice our rollbacks. It is like a common discussion we have at our tech meetings. Like, when are we going to practice our rollbacks? Uh, next week, maybe next month. But we we've never rolled back. So during our time, I, during my release time, any time I've released, there there has never been a major issue where the site went down. We have had like some some little gotchas later on, and the, this was way before, um, where a database table was missing, or <laughs> what was it? There was something, and I was just like, oh, that's not good. That's, that's going to be fixed. <laughs> um, there was just like some things that we know that we might not see when we deploy the stage, and then we see it in production. Um, the database table is one of my... Uh, 
our table for our dashboards was missing and we just just basically took that table from stage and put it into the production because it was a brand new table. It wasn't like somebody's used it beforehand. Um, any more questions? How do you polish the database? How do I, how do you what? How do you polish the database changes? How do I, I'm sorry. How oh. do you publish the database changes? The publish the database changes. Okay. Uh, like the, the database update. Um, <coughs> The the actual MA deploy is what we call it, or MA release now, um, does all that stuff for us. So we have like a sequence where it says it will deploy the code first, config import, and then update the database, and then also do the cache build and uh, clear the varnish for us. So everything is all done with our deploy, and it's a little command that. Um, Oh, it's not a little command. It's a big command that we use to deploy to production. Are you using Selenium with Behat? Yeah. Or not? No. Have you, have you talked about it? We did. We tried to do. I think we tried to do it early on. There was something with the PHP unit testing. We tried way back when. It was yeah. an early attempt at yeah. doing JavaScript for the alerts. Yeah. We, we did try some of that, but we just couldn't incorporate it into the project. <laughs> Any other questions? All right.